And welcome back to the broadcast. World-renowned photographer Roy Gallant is joining us. I had a chance to look at some of his images. The photography is extraordinary. Welcome to the broadcast. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm a runner, so I run early in the morning, and the air, the peacefulness, the pureness, and the birds chirping is like a choir every morning. It's as if I've awakened to a whole new world in the age of COVID-19. What is it like, and you probably haven't had a chance to really experience it uh, like you probably want to, uh, in terms of for you as a photographer, what has changed? So, uh, yeah, I mean, life has come to a complete halt and, uh, you know, we're trying to do as much as we can with it. So uh, if I can't travel all over the world, I travel virtually. And if I can't do on any of my public speaking, so I'm doing it live, like I'm doing now with you. So, so I think the thing that changed the most is our freedom has been trans transferred or transformed into the virtual space. Talk to us about how you got started and tell us a little about your work. So I got started in wildlife photography when I first went to Tanzania in 2006. And what I saw there really changed me in the most thorough way possible. So, uh, I mean, up until that point, yeah, I loved animals like everyone does. But when I went there as a photographer, I saw the intensity of, of the wild and, and, you know, all the, 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 the action that's going on. And it has been going on that way for millions of years. And that made me realize in a more humble way our place on this planet. And that's when I decided to take my photography uh, to that aspect and be focused 150% on wildlife photography. And the more I traveled the world and the more I saw, the more environmental I got. So I, cause I saw everything changing. I mean, I can see the change uh, going on in the last decade that I've been photographing. And unfortunately the change is real. So now I'm using my photography not as just a means of taking nice photos, which is great and fun and all, but photography is also a means of communication. So I'm using my photography to, to share those stories with people all over the world and mostly about areas where no one else can go, like polar bears near the North Pole or uh, bears in Kamchatka, or jaguars in Brazil, or penguins in Antarctica, and so on and so on. So photography is not just clicking, snapping away photos. Uh, it's a way to deliver a message uh, to the world, and that's what I'm trying to do now. What separates you from all other photographers? What is your special gift? Uh, so there are many awesome photographers out there. I mean, I have some amazing colleagues and I think that everyone is trying, I mean, not everyone, but let's say the top ones are trying to make a change as well as I am. And I think that's uh, one thing that separates uh, from the others. So uh, as a photographer today versus, I mean, unlike previous decades, today a photographer has to do everything. So it's a one-stop shop production company. Uh, so you got to go out there and you got to take the photos and you take the videos and you do aerial and drone photography and then you talk about it and you share your stories uh, and you write about it and you do magazine articles and you do onwards and more and more and more and more and more. And more. So you got to be uh, really well uh knowledge knowledgeable about everything so that's one thing that you have to do and, and you have to do it really well the other thing is you have to have a message so it's not just you know i'm taking photos it's i'm trying to save the world and i'm trying to do that for future generations so uh, with my public speaking i've done three ted talks and i've done i talked at the united nations and i'm doing a lot of environmental diplomacy I met with government officials. I'm a Greenpeace ambassador. I'm trying to stop oil and gas drilling near the North Pole and create ocean sanctuaries all over the world. So I think that the thing that changes 
and, and differentiate is, is what you do with it. Because there are a lot of awesome photographers, uh, just as good as me and even better than me. I, I mean, I don't mind uh, admitting that. But the, the difference is what you do with it. And I think that's the key, the key factor here. Oh, well, listen, um, you know, photography is art in, it, in its finest form. Uh, and obviously you are an artist. Are there places in the world that are, that are really more special than others? Uh, every place has this uniqueness. I mean, every place is special. I found that there is no such thing as a boring place. Uh, I mean, I just, I, I travel the world. I, I even, I, I live in Manhattan. I, I'm in Manhattan in my apartment right now. And, and even here, you just walk around in, in, in the parks, the Central Park, and it's, it's amazing. But uh, if you ask me if there are places that are more special than others, yeah, of course, we all have a favorite. And, and my favorites are the places that are more rare. I mean, the hidden gems. And I'm talking about uh, my favorite place in the world is Svalbard. So Svalbard is in the Norwegian archipelago. It's about halfway between Norway, the Nor Nor Norwegian tip, and the North Pole itself. So uh, it's about 80 degrees latitude. And, and when I'm there, there are almost no people around. And where I go, there are no people at all because I'm using uh, special production permits because I'm doing films for, for the BBC and, and many other channels. And um, so that's my favorite place because when you're face to face with a polar bear, uh, and that's the world's largest land predator. And it's just super awesome and super impressive. And they're super smart and intelligent. And, and when you're there and, and you walk around in this terrain, which is like something from another planet, and in the sense that it's, uh, it's a white desert, so it's a desert, but it's frozen, and the sun doesn't set at all so you have sun even in the middle of the night you're between april and august and it's i mean i i like the different i like the unique and that's the most unique place there is on earth where can people learn more about your photography and more about you so of course you can go to my website uh www.galitz.com and you can look up my Instagram, just Roy Gallitz, and of course, uh, Facebook and, you know, all the social media. So um, I'm happy to share. I'm also doing some, you know, YouTube tutorials about photography and about the places that I go to. Uh, and I'm, I'd be happy for you to, to follow and join. Uh, is it a challenge for you uh, being locked down with your wife and four kids? And are you raring to get out to the world of photography? Uh, is there a need for you to be home right now that you probably didn't realize until during the era of COVID-19? So during this time of COVID-19, I mean, this is a great time to learn photography and share because we are all stuck at home. There is no more FOMO. But, you know, I've been talking to my friends in, in Svalbard, where I was just told you about with the polar bears. And they tell me that, listen, this time of COVID-19, this place, which you know has some kind of tourism, uh, is completely abandoned. So uh, they just went on the ice last week looking for polar bears, and they say that nature is is just so amazing at this point of the year, where there are no boats cruising around, no people coming. I mean, nature all over the world. Even I talk to people in Tanzania, my friends in Tanzania, also there. No cars, no, no uh, tourists, nothing. You can see how nature is reclaiming its, its realm. I mean, you can see nature going back into cities. You can see, uh, you know, deers going around in the middle of town. You can see in India, you can see everywhere. I mean, nature has this amazing ability to, to recover itself in a super fast way. And, and I think that we are learning a, learning a very valuable lesson. And another lesson that I think we're learning is how we are not above nature. We are a part of nature. And nature reminds us that with this tiny invisible virus that we can't even see. And showing us, listen, you are not masters of the universe. You are still a part of this ecosystem. 
And I think that's a valuable lesson that we should take with us. You know, I know in the interest of time, I've got to, I've got to ask you this. I'd love for you to talk about the impact of the fires in British Columbia and California and the Amazon in Australia uh, before we say goodbye to you, because I know you've covered it firsthand. Yeah, so I, I did cover uh, also the, the warmer places, not just the frigid, cold uh, uh, areas of, uh, of the, in the Arctic. Um, but when I when I go to the to, to the warmer places, I mean, I've just been uh, at the end of 2019. I've been to Pantanal in Brazil, and I can tell you that uh, it's first. I don't like the heat. I prefer the cold. <laughs> but uh, the, the nature there. I mean, when you have the energy of the system, like you have in Tanzania and and Brazil and and Indonesia and whatever. Uh, you have that rain, sun, uh, water, uh, you have all this rich ecosystem which has a lot of uh, herbivores, a lot of grass eaters, and then you have a lot of carnivores and predators, and then you have the, the system that always is, is always very, very active. Uh, you can't always see it because sometimes it's deep in the bush, but you, when you do see it, it's really amazing. So in Tanzania, for example, you can see there's um, great migration of two and a half million wildebeest and zebras going around following the rain patterns. And then you have a lot of predators just uh, eating the buffet, you can say, uh, with lions and cheetahs and leopards and hyenas and so on. And also in Brazil, you have the river going through the Pantanal or the Amazon River, uh, just going through the Amazon basin. And then you have all these... Uh, again, all these animals that that just uh, um, feast on this rich nutrient environment, and then all the ecosystem is very, very active. I mean, look at Costa Rica, for example, a place, an amazing place. It's a bridge between North and South America, and it's a bridge between the Atlantic Ocean with the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean. So Costa Rica, although it's so tiny, has about 5% of the biodiversity of species on Earth. I mean, just talking from little invertebrates to large creatures. I mean, you have everything in Costa Rica. So I think that's the difference. And, and that's what amazes me the most about those places. I mean, the intensity and the biodiversity of, of the raw nature as it is. So it's... <laughs> it's an experience that everyone's got to got to feel. What, what what is what is the likelihood that we will have significant extinction extinctions of certain animals during our lifetime? Come again, I hear you very badly, sorry. What is the likelihood that we have extinctions of certain animals during our lifetime? Well, what is the probability of getting extinctions of animals during our lifetime? I mean, 100% I mean, 100% in the sense that every year we have dozens of species going extinct. So, I mean, we just had the northern uh, white rhino going extinct last uh, two years ago with the Sudan. Sudan was the last male white, northern white rhino in, in, in Kenya. So species are going extinct every year, every year, and they will continue to do so uh as as the climate changes and it changes i mean you can't deny it you can see the numbers and um, even and that's what i'm working about on i mean i'm working one of my uh, strongest projects that i'm working on is the saiga antelope and the saiga antelope is this amazing antelope and the border with uh, russia and kazakhstan it's a big nose like looks like something from star wars antelope and within the last 30 years this antelope has gone from least concerned in the IUCN, in the United Nations Endangered Species List, to critically endangered. I mean, within 30 years, least concerned, millions of animals to critically endangered with, I know, less than 100,000 animals. And predictions say that they might go totally extinct within the next decade. I mean, that's staggering. I mean, we can change, and change happens uh, uh, most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the times because of human interactions. With the saiga antelope, for example, it's due to industrial hunting and increasing heat waves. So you have heat waves that just kill them off and you have hunters that just kill them for 
using their horns in Chinese traditional medicine, same like rhinos. Okay, polar bears are going extinct because ice, sea ice is melting and polar bears rely on sea ice to hunt seals. Without sea ice, they can't hunt. Without sea ice, they're going, star they're starving and going extinct. So in, in that sense, 60% uh, of polar bears will probably go extinct by 2050 and 100% will probably be gone between, uh, before the end of the century because you just need a couple of warmer years with almost no sea ice and I mean it's mass starvation for all polar bears. So unfortunately the answer to your question is absolutely yes. Roy Galitz, it is certainly it's been a pleasure having you on as a world-class photographer we love your stuff on bbc and other places thank you for joining us and we look forward thank you so to connecting much. with you again in the future thank you so much <laughs>